While humans have been preparing and consuming microbial foods for thousands of years, it wasn't until relatively recent in history that humans first visualized individual microbes. The story of how this came to happen takes us back just a little over 300 years, to the mid-1600s, to the town of Delft in the Netherlands, beautifully drawn here in this painting by Johannes Vermeer. Amongst the Delft canals, there lived a contemporary of Vermeer, an enterprising textile merchant by the name of Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He was driven by a great curiosity to explore the world around him and, as part of his trade, he wanted to be better able to assess the quality of the cloths he bought and sold. To achieve closer and closer inspection of the threads, Van Leeuwenhoek learned the craft of lens grinding and polishing. He became quite good at it, eventually producing small spherical lenses that allowed magnifications never before accomplished by humans. He placed these lenses in rudimentary metal mounts, inventing the world's first microscopes. By placing samples in the pin-shaped holder and viewing them through his outstanding lenses, he was able to see dimensions no one had seen before. To his astonishment, he discovered tiny little forms, which, for the lack of better word, he called little animals or animalcules. He noticed that they were of varied forms and remarkably numerous, writing in 1683, all the people living in our United Netherlands are not as many as the living animals that I carry in my mouth this very day. Imagine, if you will, that you are Van Leeuwenhoek and are seeing through one of his microscopes at a single drop of water collected from one of the canals of Delft. This is what you would have seen. A remarkable array of living entities. Some of the bigger ones are animals indeed such as the rotifer that is being tracked. But the smaller ones, swimming along rapidly, those are bacteria, and there are a few thousands of a millimeter, impossible to see with the naked eye. Yet these tiny microbes are responsible for all those wonderful fermentations that produce the beverages and foods we will be discussing in this course. It's truly a marvelous sight to behold the microbial activity that can be going on in a single drop of water. But Van Leeuwenhoek's discovery would remain pretty much a curiosity for a couple of centuries. It was not until the second half of the 19th century that the French scientist Louis Pasteur came onto the scene and began to truly study the activities that were catalyzed by these tiniest of living creatures. Driven to solve practical problems, Pasteur became interested in studying wine production and the reasons why wine went bad. Being French, and wine being a key beverage in French culture, Pasteur knew there would be great interest in his studies on this topic. At the time, many people still believed that processes such as the turning of grape juice into wine happened spontaneously. This is a so-called theory of spontaneous generation of life. Simply by having liquids such as beef broth or grape juice in contact with air, microbes would be formed. Pasteur elegantly debunked that theory. First, he recognized that by heating such liquids, he could kill all the microbes present. In other words, he could sterilize the liquids. Then, by making gooseneck flasks containing sterile medium, Pasteur was able to show that the medium would remain sterile despite it still having contact with the outside air. This ability to sterilize liquid allowed him to later on put into them new microbes and study their properties. We call this act of putting microbes into a growth medium inoculation. Having starting materials that are sterile or largely devoid of microbes can be a very useful practice when cooking with microbes, so do keep that in mind. Now, Pasteur had been trained as a chemist and was keenly interested in understanding the chemical transformations of matter that took place on Earth. One such transformation is the conversion of grape juice into wine. At the time, it was already known that the sugars in grape juice were converted to the gas carbon dioxide, or CO2, plus alcohol, ethanol to be precise. But how this conversion was carried out was not known. 
Using his ability to sterilize liquids, Pasteur showed that he could inoculate sterile grape juice with a particular microbe, and this would lead to the production of wine. He also was able to show that other microbes, when they contaminated the grape juice, were what caused the wine to go bad. For example, turn it into vinegar. The wine-making microbe was one that is going to become a close friend of ours in this course, the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Here we see an image of this yeast, also known as baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. It has the same general microbe that makes wine is our friend that we use to make beer and bread. Though there are subtle differences in the strains that we use to produce each of those microbial foods. But we'll deal with that later. For now, let us simply appreciate the beauty of this microbe as we observe it magnified many thousands of times. Pasteur's discovery led to much better practices in winemaking, something the French, and the whole world for that matter, very much appreciated. It is still possible to go to restaurants in the French countryside and see these posters acknowledging the importance of Pasteur's work. Let me loosely translate the text around the image of Pasteur. Give preferences to restaurants that include the wine in the price of the meal. Average of human life, 59 years for a water drinker, 65 years for a wine drinker. 87% of the centenarians are wine drinkers. Wine is the milk of all people. And last and most importantly, a quote directly from Pasteur. Wine is the healthiest and most hygienic beverage. Now we know how we, as humans, first came to visualize microbes and first began to understand their role in making fermented foods.